right. Good evening. My name is Danielle Apfelbaum, and I am the Scholarly Communications Librarian at the Thomas D. Greenlee Library. Thank you for joining us tonight for the final virtual STEM poetry reading series at Farmingdale State College. Funded by a 2022 Students First grant, this virtual series has two primary goals. First, to expose the FSC community to the work of poets writing about and or working within STEM, and second, to enhance the FSC community's engagement with STEM majors at FSC through conversation with authors about the synergistic relationship between STEM and poetry. Currently, camera and microphone access is disabled for attendees. If you wish to make comments throughout the reading, please feel free to utilize the chat feature. If you have questions for readers, please utilize the Q&A feature and we'll get to those questions at the close of the reading. Or of course, you can use the chat function as well. Please note that this reading is being recorded and it will be made available via YouTube and you can access that through our home page, which I will pop right into the chat. If you give me one moment. So finally, if you have been to a poetry reading in the past, uh, you'll note that ours has a bit of a spin uh, on this. Each of our poets will read for approximately 20 to 25 minutes. We'll have a bit of a discussion about the synergy between poetry and STEM work and vice versa. And we'll end with a little challenge for the audience. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first reader, Andrea Fry. Andrea was born in Dallas, raised mainly in New York City and in the Catskill Mountains, and educated at Union College and Columbia University. She published her first collection of poems, The Bottle Diggers, in May 2017 from Turning Point Press. Her second collection, Poisons and Antidotes, followed in August of 2021, Deerbrook Editions. She has been nominated twice for the Pushcart Prize. She was a finalist in Georgia College's Arts and Letters Prize Contest, a semi-finalist in the Gulf Coast Prize in Poetry, and a semi-finalist in River Sticks International Poetry Contest. Her poems have appeared in Alaska Quarterly Review, Annals of Internal Medicine, Barrow Street, Huron Review, Cimarron Review, The Comstock Review, The Lake, Spoon River Poetry Review, Stanford Literary Review, St. Petersburg Review, Women's Review of Books, Writers Resist, and others. Andrea is an oncology nurse practitioner at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you so much, Danielle, and thank you, Farmingdale State College, for giving me this opportunity to read tonight. It's a, it's a real thrill, and I'm very excited to be reading with Jan Khan as well. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, a poem in my uh, most recent collection uh, called Poisons and Antidotes. Um, and the poem itself is called Mothballs. And I'll just mention that uh, another word for mothballs is naphthalene, mothballs. If we didn't know you, we might see the innocuous, peppermints, a dwarf snowballs, moon rocks, or marshmallows. Not like the red mushroom that screams its deadliness. You are wholly without color, a negative white, never to be found in nature or a prism. And with your whiteness, nothing to interpret, no distinction. You are not soft like cotton, nor sweet like gum, which reveals an inner goodness. Yet neither has evil appropriated your appearance. Maybe it's just that. You are nothing, just filler, weightless styrofoam pellets. But then again, you could be blank brains, psychopaths, a little gang of white supremacists, a litter of pit bulls hammered senseless, tiny Putin faces with chemical whiskers, white charcoal briquettes that could burn down the block with one match. Or if we'd forgotten you were there and we came upon a stray white ball rolled in dust at rest in the corner, a strange marble out of context without landmarks like your 1950s packaging, fumes dulled and so all the more insidious and in not remembering, we'd underestimate your power, be too casual with you, let you share the drawer with loose change, unknown keys, lozenges, and paper clips. But naphthalene, what if we never knew you? Like a child who believes she's found a boring, unwrapped mint, the kind in an old person's candy dish that's stale that no one takes, but is still the closest thing this moment in her discovery to sugar. So she raises it to her mouth, 
closes her eyes and tilts her head back while her tongue softens, ready for that sweet memory to come again. So um, I've been an oncology nurse practitioner for about uh, 16 years, and it's been about 16 years that I've been um, mining those experiences uh, for my poetry. This next poem is called Advanced, <coughs> excuse me, Advanced Directives. If the situation should arise in which there is no reasonable expectation of my recovery, you've asked that I provide instructions. In the event that I am incapacitated, you have said it would be prudent of me to spell out to a designated representative exactly what can and can't be done to my body. Furthermore, it has been suggested by other reasonable people to consider such things when I am of sound mind and body so that I can die with dignity, since dying with dignity is all any of us can ask, and since we can't ask not to die. If the situation should arise when I am unable to make my own health care decisions, unlike now when I smell onions frying and the curry leaves mingle perfectly with the goat, and I've just seen the wood duck claim the box I hung in the cedar swamp, and I can't stop smiling at the twang of the banjo, and I feel randy for the first time since winter, unlike now when life-sustaining measures are less brutal. In the event that my heart is so diseased that it falls into a renegade rhythm, pulsing and pumping indiscriminately while my abandoned kidneys scream and my hands and toes purple in quiet protest, Perhaps I don't want reasonable people to mount my chest like bushwhackers crashing the forest, smash my ribs and slam my heart silly back into this world. If the situation should arise that I can't breathe and I open my mouth as wide as I can and suck and heave the air with all my strength, but still can't usher enough of it into my lungs, am I thinking of dignity? It is in accordance with my convictions and beliefs that I have loved someone well for 50 years, and my heart warms like a cat in the sun when I see him. The tap dancer so in love with the gentle rhythm of her own clicks, can't imagine her body imploding from tumor. I request my healthcare agent make decisions in accordance with my wishes, knowing also that I've wasted my life until now. And why I, while I lie dying, I see the softest snowfall for the first time and ask that you disregard anything previously uttered by my sound mind and body. This next poem is called uh, Narcan. And you probably know that Narcan is uh, given to someone who has suffered an opiate overdose. Narcan. It's like a fantasy, a fierce correction of the stars, Superhero on the scene grabs morphine by the scruff, yanks the milk mouth from their glut of ecstasy. It's straightforward as prayer, humble as a wish. What else on earth can do this? The chemical crane, deus ex machina, that lifts soldiers good as gone, turns their limp bodies over onto dry sand, fixes their eyes back into the sun. I can see her blue lips whiten, her glistening skin dry, her caved chest arches and her mouth springs open, strains like a chick for breath, her breast a heaving bellows, and then that softening of her face, a gentle tick around her lip. I believe, but so must she accept the burden of pure gift. So when I first started writing poetry, which was a, a number of years ago, I thought it really was uh, reserved for uh, only sad topics like um, death and heartbreak and divorce. And um, interestingly, once I started uh, in nursing, I realized that um, really nothing was off the table um, that I could write about and um, especially um, and including humor. This next poem is called Evolution. In the beginning was the octopus. It would mimic whatever it saw. Lionfish, jellyfish, shrimp, crab. And it was good. It was so good, it became known as the mimic octopus. Its flounder imitation was especially good. Soon it became known as the fish mimicking mimic octopus. 
and in time, a jawfish appeared who wanted dominion over all of the fish. So it made itself into the octopus's likeness and it mimicked the fish mimicking mimic octopus. And it too was good, but the octopus had the jawfish's impression down cold as a mackerel. It had already mastered mimicking the jawfish that mimicked the fish mimicking mimic octopus. And it was all good. And that was just the beginning. So um, my collection, um, of, as I said, Poisons and Antidotes, um, is about the continuum that substances exist on. Um, dosage and state can determine if a medication or a substance is lethal or helpful, where it lies on that continuum. And um, it's interesting, Andre Gide said that uh, the color of truth is gray. Um, and if you think about it, gray is the continuum between black and white, all of those gray, uh, gray scales. And this continuum can get very complex because of the, the, uh, the range of subtleties and the, the gradations. Um, and as it gets more and more complex and we try to understand all of those subtleties, all of those gradations, we tend to sometimes oversimplify or dumb things down to make it all more retainable. And uh, this next poem is called The Glitter of the Simple. Uh, it was published in the uh, Annals of Internal Medicine. Oh, I would divide the world into binaries, cast each earthly element to a pole, good or bad, according to its flag. The stonefish with its ugly mug, black whiskered tarantula, simply by appearances I would judge. And likewise, disregarding conflicting evidence, I would crown the beautiful, the uncanny blues and gold of the poison dart frog the sacred passion flower ringed by purple filaments, though its cool smiles nest in leaves of cyanide. Then I would round the numbers up or down, toss out their remainder, throw out the imperfect squares, too cumbersome to carry. I would ignore details. Castor oil is good, but the beans will kill you if you chew them. He stole the turnips, for he had nothing. The responsibility of understanding extenuating circumstance exhausts me. The charge of calculating dose so as not to wander to the dark side of the continuum overwhelms me. Both substance and creature slink over a delicate border, can so easily pass from poison to antidote when lethal foxglove tempers a bedeviled heart or the heretic pulls his mind out of the mud, climbs from ignominy to acclamation, to be cheered by the crowd and rise with the sun. My animal brain is too weary, too lazy to carry all the infinitesimal gradations that live within the range. It is too much to fathom. I would put each in an opposing corner and discard the entire in-between. Even life's gravity would go away, become as simple as melodrama, snidely whiplash and Dudley do-right, cherry without a stone, child with no crime. The surface iridescence of the beetle's wing would be everything. How clean the world would be and damned. So, I think that when you bring together seemingly disparate subjects, whether they're STEM subjects, uh, science or medicine, uh, mathematics, engineering, engineering, and poetry, I think it becomes a catalyst for the imagination. And that juxtaposition is not limited to STEM subjects and poetry. Um, it's also uh, could be other kinds of contrasts, such as um, public versus private, or the individual versus the universal. This next poem is called The Secret. A girl hides in the underworld below her family's porch, among cinder blocks, clumps of sand, a cracked garden hose, and speaks her secret to herself. And when she hears her own voice say out loud a truth she'd never told before, the world's whispers turn to voices and the voices speak the answers to the questions. And then 
a mutiny of secrets, where all the earth's banished truths, all of history's grave secrets and secret graves rouse a universal reckoning. She hears them spill into the skies like the flap and caw of prehistoric birds who've come to claim their carrion. Carcasses of hidden longings once pressed like fossils come alive. Grand mysteries the size of mastodons awaken from their icy beds lying next to trilobites of fibs. She hears old blood tell the story of its stain, sees the body surface from the ocean's maw. Every revelation rises luminescent in the phosphor bay. All love, hurt, and shame declared, evil bared, fears and sins confessed. And she wonders if the world might spin a different course now, might even unwind, undo the tapestry wrought of tales, unravel at its fringe. And for a millisecond, she is certain there is perfect knowledge, no thoughts suppressed, nothing clandestine, no underside. But she sees the river start to pool around the stone and the riverbed begin to wear again the currents flow. She sees a herd halfway buried in a veil of sand. A girl hides in the underworld below her family's porch and keeps her secret to herself. As sunlight rains through lattice slats, stripes the ground, and every banished truth, every secret that was outcast, finds its hiding place again. So I love um, any kind of flight metaphor um, because to me that um, that is the imagination. And I'm going to read um, my next poem is actually from my first collection, which is. Um, the Bottle Diggers. And this poem is called um, The Magic Carpet. The Magic Carpet. They threw out that old rug about the same time they threw out the marriage. I found it in a coil leaning against our house like a drunk, kinked in its middle, the water meter keeping its head upright. Steadying its bent neck, I hauled it into the sun, then lowered it into a rectangle of perfect noon light. On my knees, I unrolled it, spread it out, coaxing its crooked spine to lie flat. I studied its weave, four shades of brown pinned by a grid of black tracks. My brother Rob drifted up, and I whispered to him just what this rug was. My voice was soft and slow as if beginning a story. I told him it would first fly to Albuquerque and then to Buckingham Palace and then to Asia in that order. I discovered my embellishments as I uttered them, felt my power grow as my voice became bolder in its pronouncements. I beckoned Rob closer, signaling that the time was approaching. He listened with gravity and ceremoniously, we both sat down on the rug to wait for takeoff. In late evening, when the belly of the sun had dropped below the horizon and its rose sheen backlit our world, we got up and went into our house, unaware that it hadn't happened, that we hadn't invoked magic, because we had left with the night sky still glowing and the peepers still speaking, because nothing was finished. And in my, my next to last poem, is also about uh, tying disparate things together. And it's called No Place of Sorrow. I'm told of a man who carries a sack of turnips dusted with dirt across the country to a woman he doesn't yet know. I watched a boy nail a string of purple neon lights to the cross on his venerable grandfather's grave. These offerings don't come from a place of sorrow. A woman wore dark glasses to cover her eyes, said she needed a miracle. So she left in the twilight for Tulsa to tithe to the Oral Roberts Evangelistic Association. An act of desperation, maybe, or innocence, but not yet despair. I traffic in hope, for I am hopeless. I trend with the guileless, for I am with guile. I without offering, peek from the bush at the singular bower bird wrapped in his exotic dream. He lays his carpet of blue bottle caps, blue marbles and bluets, his bubblegum pink pom-pom crest, a garish corsage of joy. 
I watch his spastic but earnest dance. You who are silly, you without sorrow, I choose. And let's see. I'm gonna close with a poem that is kind of a, a, a personal statement about how my, my avocation and my vocation uh, live together in, in my own brain. And this poem is called The Gnarled and Fantastic. I don't want a soul crushing job, my nephew says. And so I look down at my chest as if to check my own soul. And yes, it is crushed. So I tell him, well, they've all been soul crushing, every one. Work that is on rare occasion harrowing, but mostly boring. Sometimes, Ian, if I'm sitting quietly in my chair at work, the lights go off because the motion sensor thinks I don't exist. I flail my arms to restore my station in the universe. I'll take my place among the other trillion cogs, even take a perverse pleasure in never standing outside the world's drill. I can only be among those who embrace some routine, those who sell, scrub, collate, slice onions, cut out gallstones, tally, enter data, teach a child to wash her hands, lay wire, pour concrete, test urine, convince judges, hold meetings. Most everyone's a doer of unmemorable things, every job a sledgehammer to some other impulse. Call it your soul if you wish. But why shouldn't the soul have to work like the rest of our being, like the gut, the lungs, the bowels, or heart? The soul must be sufficiently crushed to escape, like that crocodile that crossed the canal on a blue foam noodle to save itself. There's a knowledge gained in being behind bars that prepares you for the change, that different morning, the one that brings the rider on his red horse to the purple myrtle. That's when you'll run, convict, against the sunrise and November wind. You'll peel off your clothing and let each rag fall to the furrows as you tear across fields. The echo of the dogs does not stop you, for you are at the edge of the woods. And you'll enter them as a solemn child. You'll look upward into the trees and see the limbs, gnarled and fantastic. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Andrea. I'm going to take a moment just to switch the spotlights. Hold on one moment. There we go. And our next reader is Jan Kahn. Jan is a biologist, poet, and painter. She studies the ecology and evolution of Amazonian mosquitoes that transmit the malaria parasite as a research scientist at the Wadsworth Center, New York State Department of Health, and a professor of biomedical sciences at SUNY Albany. She combines field and lab studies to gain deeper insights into the environmental factors that influence mosquito behavior. behavior. In her latest book, Peony Vertigo, Brick Books, Fall 2023, her poems interface with STEM via climate, landscape, and grief. She imagines herself a peony, a salamander, a fish, and an ancient cave painting. She engages with the Brazilian writer Clarice Lispector, and please uh, correct me if I pronounce that um, incorrectly, about drought and species loss. She imagines the super collider contending with the sock, and she questions the world of AI. Jaguar Rain, Brick Books, 2006, focused on the ecological interdependence of everything in the Amazonian landscape through the eyes of the notable explorer and ar artist Margaret Mead. Her paintings range from those that render the turbulence of climate devastation, forest fires, and disappearing, disappearing aquifers to the vibrant tranquility of Japanese landscapes. Welcome, Jan. Jan, I think you're muted. There you Danielle, go. I want to thank Danielle for organizing this and, and spearheading it and taking a big risk um, to bring this to so many people at Farmington and on YouTube and Andrea for reading with me and the whole plan for getting, making eff great efforts to connect disparate groups of people who are often very siloed. I 
I'm a biologist, but I think also a great deal about mathematics and physics. So this one started off with um, wondering um, what would happen to the super collider. It's called battered civilization. A sock particle was detected in the super, super collider. Can we make time out of bacteria? Trade genomes for another year of elephants? A parody of my pernicious scheme unravels, but the scheme itself is silk. Which is more pervasive, night mist or provincialism? The hidden world of buzz saws shakes me from sleep. I was trying to hold my own. I don't like canned salmon except the crunchy bones. Above the city walls float medieval pennants. Listen to Neil Young. You'll get it. Into deepening blackness lit by a branch of forsythia, I stride forward, edges inflamed, and inch sideways out of my body. I am all pause, all hesitation, a foot on carpet, a foot on cold stone floor, of my earlier existence, all that remains is a gray felt hat. I release my internal structure. It rises to the top and floats. Did I mention my undocumented status? My recharged emotional state? The big green fractal tree bent and streaming in the hurricane force wind. Our corpora alata are shrunken by the wanton application of neurotoxins. Something trails behind my narrow yellow shoulders, rolls in with the motorcycle. I unpack the bang box first catalyzing the situation in the baggage room. Strains of old Beatles tunes, doves moaning in the gridlocked attic. I have an earlier century in mind, a time when cotton bags were varnished for carrying water. I have been working for almost 15 years in Peru, in the Amazon region of Peru, and um, I do a lot of field work, so I spend about three months there a year, and I've seen some very interesting situations, and um, this is one. It's called Lost Marsupials, the Marvels of Santa Rosa. In the market, they appear as opossum skin hats, tins of ear bones. Beneath the gaze of Orion, we count our lucky stars. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. The snorer next door cracks the sound barrier. The bar swings into action. The TV in the room opposite is cranked to the max. To whom should we bow down in thanks for stereo sound? During their nuptial flight, male termites compulsively crawl upward, crawl upward into clothes, onto face, into ears and eyes. Mourning is filtered through the lenses of their discarded translucent wings. Where do you live? We questioned a local woman. She pointed to a mango tree, produced a jar of mouse opossum eyes. Who is the ecstatic in your immediate or extended family? 
asked the religious form. We ourselves had no one, but the neighbors had Lucia, who one night choked to death on her tongue. From a shopkeeper, we purchased cilantro and fresh oregano. He gestures toward a shack whose current tenants, hens, guinea, guinea pigs in a wooden box, he plots to evict. He'll retire among those profusely blossoming morning glories. The bathhouse is guarded by that gecko. The eye spots of the enormous cloaked moth won't protect it. This is a situation where a young woman who's an environmental engineer is trying to figure out how to function in a Brazilian sugar industry after it has gone through a, a terrible downturn, which is maybe good because less sugar is better, right? <laughs> the Brazilian sugar industry rises from its knees. The ingenious solution to your factory space crisis, that was her. Rapid assembly of the crystallizer levered through the roof into the space it couldn't fit. A popular species of sugarcane harvester she rejects, seeing its potential for rapid breakdown, corrosion in the crushing process. The backup crystallizer displayed on a flatbed swinging by, proudly reigns over the universe of floating techno-functional machinery and farmhands. Migration on the rise, no wonder. Exhausted but performing solo her vital task, the mechanistic and logical holding their own against a long history of self-doubt and obsession, she wonders, what would happen in her plane of existence should she enter the incorrect code for the formula she comprehends beyond the meaningful decimal? Conversing with the plant manager over some detail of product planning, she understands him to say, every hillside is available for the pleasure of our billboards. Then I'm very concerned about AI, as many of us are. And um, this is the, a poem in my new book called Peony Vertigo, called The Transience of Presence. The sky was clear and cold, though snow clouds were building to the east. Drifting from tree to tree in hiding, I was invisible to them, the mechanical squirrel placed in the treetops, unmoving below the faux fox in waiting mode. The squirrel that appeared to worry, target of slingshots, nest a mess, tree struck by lightning more than once, Intent on feeding her kit-like kips, the fox high-stepped forward in velvet boots. The squirrel leapt higher, facsimile fur and rodent brain near perfect. I reduced my breathing, stood in shadow. Remarkably like a fox, the fox nose raised to overhead trail, circled a fallen pine. Snow in elaborate drifts. Near dusk, a perilous time when civilization pauses, easily undermined, animals extincted. Head first, the squirrel thing descended, scrabbling through ice for a cache. Along a frozen river, their crisscrossed prints ahead of me, I came to the scattered, once impeccable, 
gadgetry and wiring. A scruffy gray overcoat trampled and torn. A larger one nearby, golden red and gleaming. And I think like everyone else who's conscious, <laughs> I'm very uh, anguished about climate change and trying to do things but feel even small things I know they're important, but they don't feel big enough. So this is called Prediction Snow. I am writing this slant because if I name the missing snow, if I speak aloud or dream the soft, delirious desire for it, even dare to whisper its sibilances, to surrender utterly to it as it descends from a loft, where it is gathered and stored and saved for later. Now is later. Do you see? We are in the later. The misplaced snow keeps coming, swirling, breathing, crystallizing, droplating elsewhere. Dear permafrost, I am face down on top of you. I am begging you. I wait for the new downfalling, gyration of each flake, a small sound, a humming, a tiny jostling murmur just beyond my hearing in the huge breath held silence. The transformation, the trans, the form, the ah, ah, all the way to the end. Wait for it. We are late. And here's a, a poem where I become an Eft. Um, Eft is a third instar. Newt, uh, it lurks around here. <laughs> we see it pretty often in the spring. It loves humidity. It's a gorgeous red orange with three or four brilliant fluorescent red uh, orange dots on its back. So it's um, always a great joy and pleasure to see so much intense beauty. Depth model of the self as eft. An eft, incandescent orange with darker orange spots, indescribably itself, crawls across the forest path toward the sheltering leaves and flowers of a woodland violet. It enters the Camino del Sueño, or is this me, a member of the species that has carelessly contributed, contributed to the near extinction of newts and their erstwhile friends and relatives long before a marvelous and monstrous black donut hole re-envelops the foreseeable and beyond. Among the violets, I find moisture and shade. There is I naturalist and my photo now added to the cloud. Distribu distribution of myself and kin, where once there were pristine water bodies and native insects. As my CNS is now deranged, incapable of envisioning the self as adult newt with the attendant responsibilities of aquatic mating, offspring production and the like. I note in my journal we need to create a pool immediately because after leaving the shelter of the violets, we are bound to seek the aquatic over the terrestrial as our life cycle requires. And no newt on earth can survive without its divine pool, vernal or otherwise, preferably surrounded by beech, maples, oaks and ash unless you deem essential the addition of certain microscopic organisms, dear amphibious spirit, with which to succor your acolytes. Our Camino del Sueño is now a tectonic fault. As we awaken in the West, having fallen asleep in the East, continental drift is triggered before the delicate instruments invented to measure 
such large scale motion, we were the ones who most longed for a pathway to the water. Now with the shimmering moon heretofore thought to be solely a Hollywood invention beneath which untold numbers of persons and my friend are calmly shooting their bodies full of fentanyl and other horrific substances. I awake a full bodied if slightly careworn human without substance or solution, aghast, overlooking a vast corrupted inland sea, nowhere on earth to lay my or my beloved friends heads. How's my time? I'm, I'm sort of lost track. Got about five minutes left. OK, I'll, I'll read one more. Uh, this is linked to the title of this book. It's called Peony. There's too much orange. The eft I cradle, salmon on whole wheat, the sitter's nail polish. This morning, my brain is programmed to unfold its peony. I turn off the house lights, recite my self-help list. How the scent disrupts the brand newness of mid-May air. Petals in my vesicles, vaulting the synaptic clefts. So quiet in the house, the sound of a fox swishing through grass on black toes is amplified. Sharp snap could be a twig, but later I discover a vole's velveteen jacket flung into the undergrowth. Bright lantern of the delicate face snuffed. Neurotransmitters texting from the peony seeds. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dan. So now we'll shift gears for a bit of a discussion. So as a librarian, I need to be able to quickly and efficiently retrieve published literature on topics that are both within and beyond my area of expertise. And my ability to construct complex but concise search strings, I think in many ways, uh, comes from my study of writing and revising formal poetry, um, more so I think than any metadata course I've ever taken. So for me, I think that poetry has had a really huge impact on the way that I consider, select, and arrange terms in order to retrieve information. I don't think I'd be as effective at this um, if I hadn't studied poetry. So along those lines, I have a few questions for you. So I'm going to move the slides along just a bit so you can um, view those questions with me. Um, I have three, actually, and you can attack these in any order that make most sense to you. But first, how does reading and writing poetry impact your work in STEM fields and or how you think about STEM related topics? How does or how has your work in or with STEM fields impacted how you read and write poetry? And what do you think poetry, what do you think poetry brings as a medium to the exploration of STEM topics? Andrea, do you want to start? Oh, I think you're muted. Now, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. OK, great. Sure, happy to start. Um, well, a few things um, I've, I've been thinking a little bit about it. Um, I'm, I'm going to start by saying that I think that in, in science and poetry, uh, and, and I'm not saying this, I've, I've heard other folks say this too in the series, and, it, and I, I, I thought it, was, it made a lot of sense, but in both science and poetry, you have to be open to the unexpected. Um, and uh, you, uh, and the flip side of that is that you need to be conscious of your own bias. Um, accuracy is important, um, both in science as well as in poetry. You have to, in poetry, you have to, you have to ask yourself: Is this voice true? Is it believable? Um, I find that um, something, uh, a term that has come up in the past for me, 
is we, when I write, I sometimes become overly enamored with a line that I've written or a word that I've written. And I have to be able to, as they say, get rid of, get rid of your darlings. Um, I think that's true for both science and poetry. Um, you have to, scientific writing has to, um, you have to really be very uh, laser focused on what the question is that you're trying to answer. Um, you have to really nail it because your, your entire uh, uh, a study will be built around that hypothesis. And the same is true with poetry. Um, what is the story that we're trying to tell? How am I going to tell it that it's going to be authentic and it's going to be, um, it's going to uh, create, it's going to basically um, uh, give to your audience what it gives to you, the poet. Um, one thing that I, I once wrote a, a, a blog for Spoon River Poetry Review uh, and I talked about how the first time when I got onto an airplane as a child and there was this schematic, um, I don't know if they have them anymore, but this schematic that showed these sort of connecting arcs from departure cities to destination cities. And they had these sort of wild connections like um, uh, arcs from Timbuktu to London to Hartford, from Hartford to Bangor, Easter Island to Houston. And I just, thought that was so exhilarating to see. And to me, it, that was kind of a metaphor for the exhilaration that I get when I connect two incongruous things or two disparate subjects. And um, it, to me, that's uh, that when you connect memories or emotions or thoughts that are seemingly different um, and you bring them together, there's, a, there's, a, there's an energy there. And I think that's very similar to the Eureka moment in science or in or in mathematics. Um, so um, I turn it over to you, Jan. I think there's a yes, I agree with um, Andrea very much. That there are a surprising number of common threads where you might not expect them to be or I actually sometimes think of them as a Mobius strip um, so that you can't really tell where the strip ends or begins because to me poetry and science have a tremendous um, amount of interchangeability even though that may sound at the outset to be a little odd but um, for science one of the things that's imperative especially now with so many online publications and so much information flooding us it's essential to read extremely extensively, to know your subject matter, to know the history, to know what other people have already published before you um, are trying to publish, because you can so easily, miss, you can repeat someone's experiments without even realizing they've, that this knowledge has already been learned, but it's sort of been ignored or forgotten. But in poetry, if you don't read extensively from the past to the present, you, you're not going to do anything really new. So new. You're always standing um, in all of these subjects on the shoulders of giants in every possible way. So you need, and you need to know the field, the trends, the discoveries. Uh, there's an awful lot of reading and thinking involved. I think uh, the second thing that occurs to me is that the editorial process in both poetry and writing a science paper is staggeringly similar. <laughs> I think the goal is clear, concise communication. And in you, I mean, the number of um, drafts of a poem or a science paper that I go through can be up to 20 or 30 in each case. And the only way I can do that effectively is giving it time. It's not possible to write well if you're in a rush all the time about everything, you have to give yourself that, the combination of time and space to get an emotional distance. And from certainly from poetry, it's hard to edit. The first thing you write, as Margaret Atwood used to say, you get into this sort of ecstatic state of creativity and the, the stuff you've written can be really very bad. But initially you feel like it's tremendously wonderful, and inspiring, exciting and novel, and you're really enthusiastic and you read it two days later and you just about want to cry. So. So that's why um, editing is just essential as can be. And the other thing I, I think that people forget about science, although you mentioned it, Andrea, and it's absolutely true, is the, cre 
the creative side of things, but particularly for me, I, I rely on my dreams and my subconscious tremendously in science to solve problems for me because I find if I'm really saturated with a subject or with a problem and I go to sleep, I very frequently dream a response or a, a, a solution to the problem or to the experimental design. It doesn't always happen in one night, but it happens a lot. And it's so easy to shut off intuition as a scientist. You, you just you have to learn to listen. It's very challenging, but it's really exciting because they can be very illuminating. That's all. <laughs> I'll just say too that, uh, and this is this is more of a practical. Um, this is sort of a practical point to uh, folks out there who are students in STEMs. You know, a lot of a lot of folks um, get into uh, you know choose STEM fields um, and subjects because they are understandably concerned about um, making a decent wage. And um, I just want to say that writing poetry and being active in in science or engineering or mathematics do not have to be conflicting or adversarial goals at all. In fact. Um, they they actually you know create this wonderful energy together and you don't have to i think you use the word silo jan that you don't have to they're not um you don't have to silo those two impulses in yourself you can you you absolutely should um allow that interplay because they feed off each other and um there's just a uh, a, a lot of imaginative energy that that comes out of that so i encourage I encourage folks to to work in STEM, work in poetry, work in STEM and write poetry, work in poetry and get interested in STEM. So um, anyway, that's my that's my uh, little uh, coaching tip. No, I, I love that point about them not being exclusive. You can have both. Um, I would always like to wrap up the sessions before we leave time for Q&A with an audience challenge. Um, so what's one thing that you'd like the members of our audience tonight to think about in terms of the intersection or synergy between STEM areas and reading and writing poetry? Or um, if you'd like to challenge our attendees to write a poem of their own, what prompt might you suggest for them? And you can address both if you like. Um, well, I, I'll give you a prompt. Um, the, uh, one of the things that I had done, um, uh, just to kind of challenge myself, I, I think, uh, you're all are, are probably familiar with found poetry where you lift text out of, um, uh, you lift, lift text out of a, a source, um, and you kind of manipulate it and create your own, create a poem out of it. So, one of the things that I did, and I'm not sure the result was particularly good. In fact, I know it wasn't, but um, it was a fun exercise. I took uh, the Dao Te Ching, and I'm not saying that very well, but even after practicing Dao Te Ching, um, I took text out of that, and I took text from uh, the NCCN guidelines, which is the National uh, Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, and I took text out of that, and I worked with both of those to create a poem. And um, as I said, it, 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 I, I'm not sure I stuck with it long enough, but I was really excited at the idea. And I think that's something that, that uh, uh, STEM students might want to try, um, particularly since you have access to a lot of different kind of interesting sources and just see what happens. It, 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 really, it really shows you, um, it really shows you uh, the juxtaposition just of the, of the, different, the different fields Kind of creates a whole new body of of of, uh, of art, and um, so it might might be something you want to try. I think, um, from my point of view, the exceptional awareness of the power and flexibility of language to explore and link ideas in science and poetry seems to be remarkably important, especially if you think about how slippery and flexible language can be. How many multiple meanings uh, words can have, how you can make them sound um, rhythmic, 
or have a great deal of cadence, not necessarily rhyming, but how you can make incredible music out of language, how that tremendously influences poetry. But if you can be a, become a very good writer in science, people actually would, will enjoy reading your work. It, it's amazing what a difference it makes between reading a, a very you know, mediocre discussion on uh, bark beetles that are destroying the Western forests and reading someone who's actually put the time and effort into writing succinctly, carefully, thoughtfully with some, maybe some kind of really cool ideas about how you might go about um, working with the environment and working with all of the people, all of the um, stakeholders involved um, and making it almost an elegant um, exploration that um, is acutely aware of listening. And I think that's um, a remarkable capacity that humans have, and we shouldn't squander it. Great, thank you so much. And so I want to leave some time uh, for Q and A. So uh, if anybody would like to ask any questions, please do throw them in the chat. And um, is there anything else? Uh, you'd all like to add regarding the questions we addressed a little bit earlier. One of the things that really got me, Jan, about what you said is that, you know, engaging with poetry also helps you with your professional writing. And I've found that that's really the case. I really uh, feel that I would not be the writer that I am today just in my day to day work um, if I hadn't studied poetry. Right, because they're not in silos. And so if you're going to work super hard on your poetry and make the language as clear and concise as you can, there's no reason why that doesn't even subconsciously, if not automatically, almost carry over into your clients. You don't have to separate those skills at all. They're, they're very fluid. They can move back and forth. I didn't, I think, um, unless Audrey has something to say, I just had something to add before I forget, because we, I didn't actually answer the three of your questions that you had up on the slide, <laughs> um, Danielle, and I had a thought about the question, which was, how does your work in STEM fields or with STEM topics impact how you read and or write poetry? Um, I think because I travel so extensively and I see people uh, in very diverse life situations in the field, in the small villages where we visit. I, um, I think it really, it's sharpened my eye and mind to details that really influence both my reading and writing. I'm forced to focus very intensively when I'm working in the field. No, nothing can really be let, let go, partly because there, of course, there are thing, nice things like, you know, dangerous snakes and all sorts of <laughs> um, insects and scorpions and things where, where everyone is working. So, but um, I think it does really influence my reading and writing. And I also have found since I started doing more and more field work that my preference for listening to and even writing poetry has become more and more associative. So I'm often struck by how things in poetry and science are linked, how they are associated, um, what kind of leaps I can make between them. I think Andrea mentioned something about that kind of almost feeling like you get charged, you know, by going back and forth between them. I think um, I also read and write haiku, and I also think that that's another phenomenal tool for people who don't know much about haiku, just to um, try really hard to capture extremely interesting moments in time. They don't have to be about the natural world. They can be about anything. Uh, there's no topic that's excluded from haiku, but when you're required to write 17 syllables on one line or three, three lines, you really learn how to write something incredibly concisely that's coherent and can be very helpful. So I think those are important to pay attention to. Yeah, I love your focus on the condensed form. Um, that really speaks to me because working with students who are doing their research, I feel like there's often this compulsion to 
get up to that word count and it's really the opposite. It's how concisely can you arrive at that point that you are trying to make? That's the beauty of the research paper, not not filling out that word count. And I found that as I progressed through grad school, I really looked back to my my work in poetry to, you know, not hit the word count, but to say what I mean to say in, you know, the most direct fashion I could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We do have some questions. So first question, how do you, for both of you, how do you choose the title for your poems? Please, Andrea, go ahead. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> well, that that can be challenging. And um, uh, I'll, I'll just say that the you want to really make the, you want to make the title uh, really work because uh, it, it's, a, it's a very important part of the poem. So, uh, if you've written this beautiful poem, but you have kind of a, a title that really doesn't um, doesn't add to or doesn't create um, a certain suspense, then you're you're missing an opportunity. So just to say that uh, it's important to uh, to make sure that title is is worthy of the poem. Um, and sometimes I I've actually lately I've just kind of been stockpiling interesting possible titles. Not because I know what the poem is going to be, but just because I love the title uh, or love the the line. Um, and sometimes they it, it you know it, it it or it doesn't happen that way. You write the poem and then you you have to wait to, for the title to come to you. Um, but um, I always I have I have boxes of of uh, uh, little bits of paper that have just lines and 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 stories and and words that I always go back to. So. It's not a. Uh, it's it's like the poem the poem itself. It, it it has to kind of emerge and. Um, but again, I I do. Um, it's good that you're thinking about titles because that's that's because it's not like a. You have a, a finite number of words in the poem and the title deserves a uh, to be part of the whole thing. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, it's it, it it the titles are in that box <laughs> as well, along with uh, uh, possibilities for poems. I had a, an instructor once who said, and I love this, he said, titles, you kind of, uh, you can Velcro them on and Velcro them off. You can just put them on and, and take it off. And you try different ones on for size. And I thought that was a great way of, of uh, describing it. That's a very, yeah, yeah it's a lovely idea. We, I also have um, lots of um, um, different um, texts that I keep um, just for possible titles, but I also feel that the the title is an integral part of the poem. It, it isn't the first line necessarily, but you're trying to engage the reader immediately with the title. You don't want to make it so like you know, kind of not haphazard, but just boring. <laughs> Why would you want a boring title if you've written a great poem, as Andrea said, but also think of it as an invitation. If you want someone to read it, they have to be intrigued. They have to think, wow, I want to find out what this is, what on earth this is, <laughs> what's coming next. That's, it's exciting, it's hard, it can be really hard, but it's really fun. We also have another question. Uh, can you describe a time when your immersion in poetry brought about a rethinking or pivot in a STEM endeavor? Well, um, I can speak to that. I think that I read a, a poem tonight called Advanced Directives, and um, we were all being trained in um, how to have that discussion with patients, you know, uh, those particularly, and especially those, uh, I have a lot of patients in oncology who uh, are very, have, have are, are ill, quite ill. And they, uh, so we were, be, we were being uh, trained to have a difficult discussion with, with patients about that. And I, I sat, I, 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 tried to think about it. It, 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 it was, it was posing a lot of, um, something I really grappled with because 
you can you can write down all of what you think you want to say in your advanced directives. You know, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. But then again, um, it's it's kind of hard to to uh, to it's kind of hard to be uh, finite about about those kinds of things. Um, and so that's the the result was my poem about advanced directives. Yes, I. Uh, I, you know, I'm saying I'm going to put all this out in my my in my document. But bear in mind that if I am seeing the most beautiful snowfall for the first time, or I I, I want the right to be able to rescind all of those directives, um, if if you know, so that's that I don't I, that's an example of how I really the two the two kind of got me thinking. I had a fairly ex eccentric experience about trying to understand where mosquitoes go to rest after they they've taken a blood meal because they can't fly very far and uh, as i was driving through a, a landscape where i knew there were a lot of mosquitoes and not seeing any of course from the car but then we were getting out and walking and i still i was really struggling to figure out where the mosquitoes are were resting and i sort of spent a poem trying to figure out how to think a little bit like a mosquito. And it was very peculiar, as you could imagine, because they have a really <laughs> different kind of, they don't have blood, they have something called hemolymph for one thing, and it's not got any red blood cells. And they have a kind of tiny, but fascinating brain. So um, it was the, land, the combination of the landscape, which was this particular part of Brazil was, um, had an awful lot of pink stones in it, um, pink rocks actually, and part, parts of granite. And um, the sheltering places that I could see, and I started looking at leaves, thinking that maybe there were mosquitoes under the leaves. So it, I don't know if I would have not had that um, sort of realization or that sort of penetrating deep thinking about where mosquitoes were going after a blood meal if I hadn't been driving and sort of musing about what the heck the mosquitoes were doing and where they were going in the landscape so we could go and try to figure out how to control them better without necessarily massacring all of them. <laughs> Some people would like to massacre all mosquitoes, but they're actually very important ecologically. So I won't get on my soapbox about why you can't kill all mosquitoes, but you can't. <laughs> I'm just double checking the chat. If there are any more questions, please do uh, throw them in there. But there's a, you're getting a lot of love in the chat right now. <laughs> um, just scrolling through. To, I see someone else is typing. So I don't want to cut off the reading before we get that last question in. But there are thank yous coming in for your responses. And I want to thank you again so much for reading tonight and for this wonderful discussion. Um, so much of what you've said has resonated with me. And again, thank you for, for sharing your work. Oh, such a pleasure. Thank you for asking. Thanks to the audience, too. Yes, thank you to everybody who attended tonight. I, just a reminder that um, the recording will be available. Uh, on our site so you can check back I would say in about a week and it should be up there with the remaining readings um, there is another comment uh, just a comment about the imagery that you both create so wonderful um, quote I wait for the snow down falling and uh, yeah again just appreciation for your work so with that, again, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, that is a wrap. And again, thank you to Andrea and Jan for joining us tonight. Um, again, check back. I'm going to pop in the link to our site. The recording will be up probably around next week. So double check and we'll have all the recordings from the series up and they'll be available to watch. So thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Wonderful. Both of you. Great pleasure.